are serious questions, aren't they? Questions that demand answers. Many theories of man's existence have been proposed, but none seem to match what we see and sense about ourselves, about our true worth. Man, in his desperate search for love, for identity, for meaning and purpose in life, will never find the answers to his questions until he discovers the roots of humankind. But then there's you and me, how do we fit into the picture, into our crowd, our family? How can I be myself unless I know who I am? Each of us, though in the company of others, in reality walks alone, alone with our dreams, our disappointments, our hopes, our heartaches, never quite knowing, even though we may come to share an intimate love relationship with someone, how to satisfy the desire for total acceptance, complete fulfillment. As we enter into marriage or seek to build a career, often the unfulfilled inner needs are temporarily translated into a drive for personal and social success, as if status and the applause of peers might somehow answer the heart's search for acceptance and love. But how many find that in popular success the very foundations of their lives have by neglect decayed away, and the prize, if won, is a piece of worthless tinsel and the loneliness from which they thought to have escaped is ever more real, ever more deadly to their long-cherished dreams of happiness. With retirement, many are confronted with the waste and futility of their lives. In these days, this realization seems to come earlier in life, and young adults reject the treadmill existence of their parents, who they sense have never discovered real meaning in their lives. We may have been able to cope with our disappointments, our loneliness, in a responsible way. But many have sought relief from the pain of alienation, from the boredom of existence and aloneness, in sexuality, in arrangements that carry no responsibility. Others seek it in alcohol or drugs. For some, these have provided a certain sense of belonging, of togetherness, a temporary satisfaction of a need that somehow cannot be suppressed. We may escape for a time the reality of our lives by following the mind-engrossing exploits of fictional lives that seem fulfilled and complete. But with the novel laid aside, the movie ended, we are again confronted by our inner selves, still crying for the love lost or never known. The mind in these dark hours searches the past for an answer to what has gone wrong or turns hopefully to the future to seek in some utopia or fantasy a reason to go on. Others seek answers in the seance chambers, in the psychic's parlor, in the sweet promise of the fortune teller's cards, in the day-to-day -day forecasts of the astrologer, in the euphoria of a chemical high, or in the chant and ritual of religious form. By whatever means, men and women seek a future that promises a meaning in life, a reason to go on with it, and in their inmost souls a hope that they will in some future day succeed in all their seeking and find the love and acceptance they must have. To many, the nature of man that has created all this aloneness and misery is a mystery. The anxieties and fears of humanity have collectively produced war and the crying needs about us, the tragedy of starving children and helpless adults. The agonies of this lonely planet demand that we look beyond ourselves for an answer to the dilemmas that we face. There is within each of us a sense of a capacity to know and be known in the fullest sense that somehow if we reach out with our minds, we can find that person, that being, that will be the answer to the needs of our personal lives. One who can say to us, I understand what is happening in your world. I understand and care about you. You are not just an accident of nature. 
not the pawn of psychological or chemical or natural evolution. You are part of a divine plan. I have not left you alone to grope aimlessly in the dark for a satisfying way of life. You are significant. For I have given you a mind with which to reason, evaluate, and choose. And since I am the one who chose you in the long ago, and whose mind you were thought of and conceived before the world began, I have also given you, in my word, the basis for making an intelligent choice that can satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who comes to me will find not only peace and rest, but security and fulfillment, and a destiny higher than human thought has dared to dream. In the beginning, God. From his throne to the limits of existence extended the power by which the universe in perfect order was maintained. From the infinite chemistry of the minutest atom to the great galactic wheels, the universe turned upon an established law of relationships. The stars in their courses followed unerringly the paths which their creator established. Within this system was created life in countless orders and forms. Worlds were populated, and between these worlds with their varying styles of life and development, the highest order of created being moved as communicators, messengers of divine will and purpose. The messengers, surpassing by far the intelligence of all other creatures, were the executors of the creator's purposes, the magistrates of his government. Their power of instantaneous travel, the ability to imitate other life forms, their musical and intellectual abilities made them welcome visitors, honored ambassadors throughout the vast complex of creation. In this ageless system, there was perfect harmony. Each object, each being bore a relationship to every other, a relationship of service and love. The messengers saw the results of creative power, but were not active in the creative process. To the one who stood first among these messengers, this limitation was a mystery and a disappointment. His name, Son of the Morning. He stood first above all created beings. To him, thousands and ten thousands paid heed, and by his intelligence, the missions of the messengers were directed. While the process of creation continued, its plans and purposes were not fully revealed. But it became obvious to this son of the morning, whose name was Lucifer, that in the council, God and his son had planned a very different, important creative event. The court of heaven was astir with curiosity, and Lucifer wanted to participate in the creator's plans, to be a creator himself, to be, like God, a life originator, to have a place in the highest council. This was his plan for himself. The Creator explained that only the Son, the one who had ever existed, the one who bore the image of God, could be included in the innermost council. Though disappointed, Lucifer appeared at first to accept this definition of his duty, and with others of his kind continued his work. But his plan he cherished, and dwelt upon until he could not and would not be content with God's plan. His plan was better. He communicated his desires to the other messengers, suggesting that they were all deserving of a higher, more independent station. 
the law of relationships for them was unnecessary. This suggestion from one who occupied so high a position was accepted by many messengers as a valid argument against the government of God. It was a controversy, the very first. It was a contest of wills. Should the system of law upon which a universe was created and operating be maintained? Or should a new principle of order be established? On this issue turned the fate of countless worlds and innumerable beings. I will fight till I win what I'm after. Fight for all. We will fight till we get what we're after. When the protest against the government of God became so noisome that it interfered with the continuing of communications to the near and distant worlds, when the accusations of those who joined Lucifer in his rebellion threatened the peace of countless peoples, there was war in heaven, and Lucifer and one-third of the messengers were exiled. Thus closed a chapter in the history of this universe, and by these events the stage was set for Earth, third planet of salt, to become the theater of the universe. Despite the exile of Lucifer and those messengers who sided with him, the process of creation continued. In a remote and heretofore darkened portion of the realms, in a space in which no matter had previously existed, there was earth without form or continence. Now in motion, reflecting the bright rays of the Creator's glory, the surface is covered with water. A stratospheric vapor shield surrounds the planet as continents appear dividing the waters. With each rotation, new features appear. Vegetation covers the surface, trees and vines yielding a bounty of ripening fruits and berries. Grass and flowers provide a surface beauty of varied color. Now a new sun lights the sky, and a second body, reflecting light, presents a surface in stark contrast to the green gardens of planet Earth. As the fifth day begins, the waters tremble with new forms of life, creatures of the deep, great and small. From the Creator's hand comes an underwater garden rich in beauty. The denizens of the deep move silently through the waters. Beside the streams and rivers which feed the great oceans, beautiful birds appear to make their nests and cheer the clear air with the music of joy and delight in the world given them. Next from the Creator's hand come the animals of field and forest, of varied size and color, each species and kind reflecting in their majestic forms the Creator's power. From the very small animals of the forest to the great herds of the plain, the population of Earth is nearly finished. Then God the Son came forth, and from the very elements of the earth, created a form so like his own as to marvel every observer. In his own image, reflecting his nature, his character, he made man. He gave to man an aspect of his own power, power to create by choice, power to decide, power to choose between alternative courses of action. When Adam had named the animals, his creator made him sleep, and from a small part of his body formed a creature more beautiful than any other in all the earth, one who would be equal in purpose and worth with him, 
to share his love and responsibilities, to be with him a partner in the creative process conferred upon him by God. Adam and Eve were joined by God as man and wife. Their love and joy and togetherness would forever be a reminder of their relationship with him and his love for them. As the sixth day of creation came to an end, Adam and Eve were invited to share the Creator's rest. Far, far more than just a physical rest, it was a time of open sharing, of knowing and being known. Adam and Eve knew that God accepted them completely. They rested with Him in learning of His plan for their lives. As that day of rest closed in another fading sunset, the father and son drew the human pair in closeness to them. Remember this day of rest, of trust, of confidence. Adam and Eve were sure it was a day they would never forget. Soon, too soon, the rest of man with God would be only a memory of Eden's dearest treasure. The life of man in his garden home was one of happiness. His work in the garden, his responsibility for the animals of earth, these things brought him pleasure and a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. His loyalty to God was demonstrated by his acceptance of the responsibilities which God had given him. Lucifer had been disloyal, had refused the place of service given him. Adam was loyal, accepting, and happy in the work God had given him to do. The loyalty of Adam was to be demonstrated in obedience to God's commandment regarding two trees placed in the garden. One tree provided the means whereby Adam might demonstrate that he chose to receive his knowledge from God, that he accepted God's word and plan for his life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a forbidden tree, and Adam and Eve planned never to go near it. But the tree of life demonstrated man's dependence upon God for life and for his every need. It was for their nourishment, and of it they could freely eat. They were happy and content in the garden. Its beauty and grandeur, the hours of peaceful bliss, were never to be broken. Until the day Eve found herself away from her husband, and only a short distance from the forbidden tree, her mind formed the question, why has God forbidden us to eat of it? And before the thought had passed from her mind, a voice echoed the doubt. With his power to imitate life forms in full use, Lucifer called Eve to the tree, demonstrating his power of speech, suggesting that she would not die, telling her she would be wise like God. She saw it was good for food. She touched it, ate, and took to Adam a small share. He was startled, disappointed, convinced that Eve would die. He could not imagine what life would be like without her. Aware of her beauty and her importance to him, he made his choice. He took the fruit and chose to yield himself and the control of the world to the enemy of God. A sense of terror seized Adam and Eve. They ran from the garden toward the darkest part of the surrounding forest. They heard the voice of the Son of God calling them and formed crude garments of leaves trying to make themselves acceptable in his presence. They were surprised that he was not angry with them. They saw that he loved them still. After all, he did come after them, sought them. His anger seemed reserved for the serpent, for the one who stood behind the serpent's mask, for Lucifer, the enemy of man and God.
calling Eve and confronting the serpent, he promised that Lucifer would lose the control of man and the world he thought he had won. The son gave the promise of his own life as a substitute for the penalty that man had brought upon himself, the sentence of death. Adam was called to take a lamb and kill it. It represented the death penalty that would be borne by an innocent victim. Placed on an altar, consumed by fire from heaven, it was acceptable as a token of a future bearer of sin's results. The sun took the crude leaf garments fashioned by Adam and Eve and replaced them with robes of his making, from the skins of the lamb, robes of righteousness. But their garden home would be theirs no longer. A messenger stood before the gate of Eden to bar their way to the tree of life. Years later, Adam held in his arms another victim, his own son, murdered by Cain. Cain fled from the growing family of Adam and established a tribe which followed his example in rebellion and crime. Centuries later, the sons of Cain and those who thought like him produced terrible evils on the earth. And Noah, nine generations from Adam, brought a warning from God that the wickedness of man was so great that the world would be reestablished by faithful men who would accept God's invitation and enter an ark Noah was commanded to build. The message of warning was given for 120 years, a message from God for his people. Noah preached and men scoffed, jested about whether there really was a God after all. Life continued. People were involved in their daily duties with making a living, getting married, living the life that was carefree, careless. Men and women ate, drank, lived as they wished with little care for the future or for the results of their actions upon their children. And all this time the ark was being built. The preparations made, the world of men now warned, the hour came. The animals assembled. From forest and field they came. Pairs and groupings of every class and order. Few, few men were obedient to the call of God. Only Noah and his small family of seven entered the ark. Storm clouds gathered and rain fell upon the earth for the first time. Men and women were caught in the rising tide. Husbands and wives struggled for the highest place. Every spot of land became precious. waters covered every possession, buried every evidence of that ancient civilization, destroying every living thing outside the ark. The ship of God's specifications rode safely above the waters. A year would pass before its precious cargo would see land again. They were bound for a new life, a new world, a new beginning for man on earth. But even as Noah bowed before God in thanksgiving for their deliverance, beside him stood doubting sons and their wives, shocked at the condition of this new world, so barren and even cold, ungrateful, thinking of the old way, the way it was before. In the children and grandchildren of these doubters, the seed of rebellion was more fully developed. Denying God, they proposed to build for themselves a tower of safety, 
higher than the floodwaters had reached, a tower in which the worship of man-made things was substituted for the worship of God. Broad ramps were built to accommodate the people. Along these ramps were stations where images were placed for worship. The peak of the tower was planned for the worship of the sun. The people were to assemble at sunrise and bow to the rising orb. This tower of self-sufficiency defied God and by its worship destroyed the people's understanding of him. Before the tower was completed, God intervened. The tower's top cornered and fell. A variety of languages was given to disperse men across the earth. Forming new nations, they took with them the elements of Babel's religion, establishing a common thread in world religions, worship of the sun, of images, and of the defiance of the Creator. History and scripture record the name of Nimrod, great-grandson of Noah, as the builder of Babylon. First to train animals in hunting, he was a curator of pre-flood religion, not the religion of God, but the religion and wisdom of the so-called ancients, and of the secret one whose name and worship had been hidden in the images and mysterious symbols of the great tower. He set himself up as like unto the gods and established the worship of the sun and planets, introduced the concepts of astrology, forecasting the future by means of signs of sun and stars. In the religion of Babylon were embodied the elements of secret cults and sects traceable down through history. Based upon tribal and other rites, advancement by degrees as in the advance through the stations of the great broken tower, these cults passed on verbally the secrets of their symbols, stars, triangles, circles, crosses, symbols of sun, moon, and planets. Behind these symbols there was the sign, the number, and the mark of the secret one, sometimes called the secret master. The story was told of this one who had existed before man, who, according to the ancients, had received in space a great injustice, whose throne was cast down and through whose worship it might all be regained. Told by many religions, it was the same story, the pointed stars of the Eastern religions and secret societies, the prophets and priests of the mystical ancient mass, all found common ground in the name and number of one whose story reached back to the very beginning, the mystery of the fallen one, the one wise in Eden, the one who promised life independent of God, the one whose war with the Creator continued, Lucifer, the enemy of God and man. In the city of Ur, the effect of this religion was clearly seen. The worship of the sun, the enthronement of priests, the chants of ecstasy and sensual rites of worship combined to draw even the most sincere of heart into a false system of worship, behind which the enemy sought to degrade and destroy the image of God and man. From this city of Ur, God called a man to come to a land he had never seen, to accept God's promise of a better life for himself and his children. The man believed God's promise. He left Ur of the Chaldees and began the long 1,200-mile journey up the Euphrates Valley toward the land of promise. To this faithful man, whom God called Abraham, and his wife Sarah, a son was promised a son through whom all nations of the earth would be blessed, a son who would carry the precious heritage of faithfulness that would eventually bring into the world the promised one of Eden's covenant. Abraham's wife, Sarah, at first believed the promise that God would give her a son, that this son would carry the precious heritage of faithfulness, he would be the bearer of the promise. In his offspring, all nations of earth would be blessed by the birth of one sent from God. But as Sarah passed the years of childbearing, she doubted, and Abraham doubted. At Sarah's urging, he took her servant Hagar as his wife, and Hagar bore Abraham's first son, Ishmael. But this was not the son of promise. And Ishmael left Abraham's camp 
and became the father of the modern Arab nations. At last, believing the promise, Sarah did conceive, and in her ninetieth year bore Isaac, the son of promise. Long waited for, he was the precious son of Abraham. And yet Abraham again was called by God, given an errand to test to the core his faith. God asked Abraham to take his son, his only son, to Mount Moriah and take his life, offer him as a sacrifice. The man who had doubted God now obeyed, raising the knife over his son. In the very act of taking his life, his hand was stopped, and God provided a substitute, a ram, a representative again of a sacrifice that God would provide centuries later. Isaac took Abraham's place as the patriarch of God's people and himself became a father. His firstborn was Esau, a man who chose to hunt his food, proud, often rebellious. His second son was Esau's twin, Jacob, who coveted the birthright of the firstborn and bargained for it to obtain by his own craft and deceit God's blessing. His effort resulted in his exile, and away from home and alone, he dreamed of a ladder of messengers passing between earth and heaven, a connection between God and man. Twenty years later, returning home with family and flocks, he hears the news that his vengeful brother Esau is coming to meet him. While pacing the river bank in the darkness, Jacob struggles with one he supposes to be his brother. Discovering that it is a heavenly visitor, Jacob pleads with the Son of God for a blessing, not on the merits of his own effort now, but on the basis of his helplessness, his dependency upon God. Jacob is blessed and is given a new name, Israel, Prince of God. His sons, the children of Israel, become a great nation. A favorite son, Joseph, becomes the prime minister of Egypt and first officer of Pharaoh's service, a planner against years of famine forecast for Egypt. Great-grandson of Israel was Moses, at first a proud man of Pharaoh's household. He became a shepherd and bore to Pharaoh the message, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go. On Egypt fell the plagues. But on the night of the deliverance of God's people, the blood of a lamb spread above the door of the faithful was a symbol of protection, of deliverance. And God led his people up and out of Egypt through the great Red Sea, leaving beneath its depths proud Pharaoh and his army. Moses was directed by God to lead his people to a better understanding of their relationship to him. These people, called by God to come out of the slavery of Egypt to worship him, bore the marks of their long years of bondage in a hostile, heathen land. To them were given the rules of healthful living that, in combination with the healing power of God, would make them free of disease, an example to the nations around them of God's plan for all people. The lesson of the manna, falling outside their camp on five mornings with a double portion on the sixth day, taught them to remember on the seventh the rest that God had established in Eden and to rest in his ability and willingness to provide for their every need. It was to them the bread of life, a diet designed to enable them to better understand the lessons of the wilderness, lessons pointing them forward to one who was to come. Water from the rock gave them another lesson of their dependence upon the one who would give to all men the water of life freely. They pitched their camp at Sinai, and heard the law of God. But within its shadow they set up an image to God, the composite of what Egypt had taught them. The calf was man's way of representing God. But mixed as it was with the sensual practices of Egyptian sun worship, it was an offense to God. Moses, returning to the camp from Mount Sinai, threw down the law, symbol of a broken covenant. Despite the disloyalty and problems of his people, God chose to set his tabernacle among them. 
to dwell with him, to provide them protection from their enemies. When the camp, on one occasion, was filled with grumbling and complaining against Moses and God, the protection lapsed, and from the sands beneath their tents, the children of Israel were attacked by deadly poisonous snakes. Many lay dying. Moses, at God's instruction, put a brazen serpent on a pole, instructing the people to look and be healed. It represented the one to whom all men might look and live, one who would one day be identified with the sins of men. The trials of 40 years of wilderness living behind them, the people of God were led out of the desert into the promised land. There, David's son Solomon built a great temple to which all nations would come and learn of the Creator, of the nature of his true relationship with man, of his promise to Adam. But the influence of Solomon's personal life and that of the kings who followed him established within the nation of Israel the worship of Baal, a sun god image, and of the bull god Moloch, upon whose red-hot altar the lives of little babies were sacrificed. For behind this religion was again the enemy of man, the secret one seeking to degrade man and eradicate God's image from the face of the earth. To the rebellious nation of Israel, God sent Elijah, a man chosen to speak for him, to call his people out of the religion of the sun god Baal and back to a relationship with the Creator, back to faithfulness to the commandments of God and the testimony of his prophets. The priests of Baal with King Ahab and his wife Jezebel combined the forces of religious and political power to bring all the nation of Israel into a system of worship which had the mark, the sign of the enemy of God. Faced with drought and famine, the king and priests tried by every means man could devise to curry the favor of God in order to bring an end to the difficulties that seemed about to destroy their nation. At this critical point in national affairs, Elijah proposed a test in which fire could come down from heaven as a signal of God's favor upon either the image worship of the priests of Baal or the simple worship of the Creator. The priests, beginning at sunrise, prepared on Mount Carmel an altar to Baal, and by chant and senseless dance they sought to please their sun god. By midday, the efforts of the priests became more frantic. They began to cut themselves and press their pleas to the point of death, but to no avail. Elijah, as the sundown hour arrived, came to the base of a long neglected altar used years before for the worship of the Creator. When it had been thoroughly soaked with water and a sacrifice prepared, he prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that Thou art God. As his prayer is finished, fire streams down from the sky to consume the sacrifice a demonstration of God's willingness to accept those who would seek Him in accordance with the teachings of His Word. The nation again was turned toward the worship of the Creator, and the drought ended. Eventually, the disloyalty of God's people led them into the captivity of New Babylon, a world empire. The royal family was taken captive, and into the court of the great nation were introduced representatives of God's people. Most prominent among the captives was another of God's prophets, Daniel. Faithful in every particular to God's requirements, he answered the demand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to describe and interpret a disturbing dream. God showed Daniel the dream and its meaning, who in turn described to Nebuchadnezzar a great image with a head of gold, its breasts and arms of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron mixed with clay, that, as described by Daniel, would not adhere or bind together. The king then saw in his dream a stone cut out without any hand touching it, and this stone struck the feet of the great metal image and reduced it to powder. The stone that struck the feet of the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The king was impressed that Daniel had been able to recount his dream with such accuracy. But the interpretation of the dream was even more amazing. Thou, O king, said Daniel, art this head of gold. Daniel explained that the great image represented the future history of the world, 
each of the metals representing a different kingdom that would for a time rule the world. The kingdom of Babylon over which Nebuchadnezzar was king was represented by the golden head of the great image. Nebuchadnezzar was disappointed to learn that the mighty empire which he had established was to be succeeded by an inferior kingdom represented in the image's breast and arms of silver. But in 538 BC, the Medes and Persians surrounded the golden city and with little resistance, Babylon fell to their armies. In 331 BC, the kingdom of silver was itself invaded by the Greek military genius Alexander the Great. He conquered the territories of the Medes and Persians and took control of all and more than Nebuchadnezzar had ever ruled. In 168 BC, Greece also fell to an invader and the remarkable prophecy of Daniel was demonstrated to be precisely accurate. The fourth kingdom, represented by the iron legs of the great image, was established by the iron-clad Roman legions who carried the iron rule of Roman law and government throughout the realms of Western civilization. When Rome fell in decay and its enfeebled political power was handed over to ecclesiastical authorities, the tribes of Europe formed what were to become, under varying forms of government, the nations of modern Europe. The iron mixed with clay which composed the feet of the great image depicted accurately the nations that would not be united. Not the conquests of Charles the Great, nor the military genius of Napoleon, nor the contrivances to unite by marriage, nor the German military adventures of Kaiser Wilhelm and Adolf Hitler could unite under one political head, the European nations. Even the establishment of a common market, a union of economic cooperation could not succeed. For prophecy had spoken, no effort of man could unite Europe, for the word of the prophet had been, they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with clay. But the last kingdom, the kingdom of the stone that was prophesied to fill the whole earth, was a kingdom that would never be destroyed, the kingdom of the king of kings, a forecast that even as the nations of modern Europe sought to reunite the old Roman Empire, the course of Earth's history would be suddenly interrupted and God would, without hands, without military or man-devised political conquest, establish His kingdom. The four great nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, arrived and departed just as predicted. The presently existing nations of modern Europe are perfectly described. The time has come for the arrival of the kingdom of the stone, the kingdom that will endure forever. Daniel saw, in later visions, the four kingdoms represented by great beasts. The first kingdom, Babylon, was represented by a great winged lion. A bear with three ribs in its mouth pictured the second kingdom, Medo-Persia. A leopard with four heads represented the third kingdom, Greece. And a fourth beast, different from all the previous beasts, represented Rome and portrayed in a powerful prophetic picture the influence of Rome down through the centuries in all of its varied and terrifying aspects. A later prophecy pictured this same power as a great red dragon viciously confronting a woman of purity who is about to give birth to a child. The dragon could only represent Rome, and the child, none other than the promised one. The Son of God had promised it, Prophets had foretold it. The faithful of all ages had eagerly looked forward to it. John the Baptist prepared the way for it. Angels announced it. He was indeed the promised one. Born of a virgin, raised in Nazareth and called to the Jordan River to receive the baptism of his cousin John. He was the son of creation's story, described by John as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Anointed One upon whom the Holy Spirit rested. He faced hunger forty days, and in a weakened condition was confronted by the tempter of Eden, the enemy of God. He faced the evil one, not with might of angels or the power of destroying fire, but with the armor God gave to every man, the word of God, the strength of God's people through the ages. 
He drove from his father's house the wicked priests whose greed and senseless traditions challenged the confidence of the sincere at heart in the tokens of God's love represented by the Lamb and other services. Jesus was a teacher, a minister of wisdom, simple wisdom the people understood. His message, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A sermon on a mountain that men would always remember, always trust, not only because the words were true, but because the life was true. He was to every man and woman what God has always desired to express, love and compassion, forgiveness and security and resting and trusting in Him. To a woman condemned by priests, scorned and shamed in public, He was a certain Savior, a forgiving God. To children, He was a kind and loving friend, one they could admire and never, never be disappointed. To the crippled and the lepers, He was the great healer, the one who never turned away anyone who called upon him for help. To the blind he was a light, the one who gave them a new life, a chance to see, to work, to live as other men lived. To the brokenhearted of every age and time, he is the comforter, the restorer, the one who can take the tangles and knots of any life and make it whole again, who can turn despair and hopelessness to triumph and happiness. He could rebuke the Pharisees as they sought to entrap him, and yet give courage and hope to mothers for their children. He brought his disciples to a supper to share with them a last message. He served them as a servant, washing their feet, teaching them of his love and of the love they must give to each other. A few hours later, in Gethsemane's garden, he reaches out to his sleeping followers for a moment of faithfulness, of understanding and encouragement in his trying hour. He is betrayed, condemned, publicly humiliated, tried before Pilate and then set before the people in contrast to the arch-criminal Barabbas. Urged on by the evil priests, the courtyard mob, forgetful of his kindness and mercy, forgetful of his life of service to them, scream, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. A great wooden cross is thrust upon his shoulders, the mob pushing around and behind him. The journey begins toward Golgotha, where Roman soldiers execute punishment reserved for the worst criminals. Behind all this mistreatment, torture, and abuse was the purpose of the evil one, the enemy of man and God. If Jesus could be forced to surrender his purpose instead of his life, all might yet be won. But the Savior trusted, resting his life with his Father. Beyond the dark clouds of separation, by faith he believed his Father's word. From heaven's highest council he had come a throne magnificent beyond description he had forsaken. From a world of light and love to a world of darkness and hate he came to display in human life, in human love, the true picture of God long obscured by the enemy. His life and death were God's love in action, the perfect revelation of God's willingness to seek and save man from his hopelessness and despairing condition. When he had tasted to the fullest extent the separation sin would bring between man and God, when he had felt the pain surpassing all other pain, he said, It is finished. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. The lamb of the evening sacrifice escaped from the priest's hand, and the law of ceremonies was retired as the true lamb of God hung between heaven and earth. He was carried to a borrowed grave mourned by a few frightened disciples, and came forth in power to give his followers of all ages a life beyond the grave. All power is given unto me, he said. That power he gave to his new church, a church filled with a vision of the love of God and the purpose of telling the world of his willingness to accept all men into his kingdom.
power Jesus gave, the power of the Holy Spirit, rested upon the church. The prophecy of Revelation pictures Jesus walking among symbols of the churches. Light-bearing candlestands represent the churches of future ages. Across the sky of John's prophetic vision, a white horse and rider pass in triumph, representing the church in its purity riding to victory, carrying to the limits of the dying Roman Empire the gospel of a crucified but living Savior. The second, a red horse, its rider with a sword, depicts the church in the hour of persecution at the hands of pagan Rome. The blood of Christian martyrs yielded in witness to their faith in Jesus. Rather than discouraging the early church, the persecution strengthened and extended its influence. More damaging than the persecution of Roman emperors was the conversion of the Emperor Constantine and the resulting declaration of Christianity as a state church. This period of time was represented in Revelation by a black horse depicting the church in its impurity, the death of its virtue and power. The influence of pagan practice brought ceremonies into the church that were nearly identical to the features of the popular Roman sun worship. The Day of the Sun, by decree of Constantine, became the day of worship for both Christian and pagan, and the symbol of sun and cross became the emblem of a church dependent upon political rather than spiritual power. The fourth, a pale horse, depicted the era when church and state attempted to destroy the remnant of those faithful to the teachings of Jesus, those who loyally maintained their allegiance to the commandments of God. To these, flaming death at the stake or weary years in a loathsome dungeon were an expected end. Death, as the pale horse illustrated, came to the church and its light was nearly extinguished in the darkest ages of the history of man. The political religious power of this period of history was shown to John as a many-headed beast of terrible ferocity, representing the nation supporting the trials and persecution of God's people down through the ages. This beast is shown to practice and prosper. This same power, shown as the horn of the dragon beast, speaks great things against God and is described as a blasphemous religious power claiming the prerogatives of God on earth. And behind this mask of religion is the evil one, the enemy of God, Lucifer, acting out through his human agents his desire to take the place of God. By his dictates, the scriptures are forbidden, the law modified and changed. A few men are still engaged in delivering the word of God to a world of darkness, but only at the risk of their lives. But honest men desire to know God's word, and men called by God studied the ancient languages, translated and published the Holy Scriptures. From the presses of Germany, the volumes of truth were spread across Europe and to the New World, where the spirit of independence and the independence of spirit reigned under spacious skies. From this nation to all the world, missionaries were dispatched bearing a message from God as seen by John. Three messengers above the earth were seen bearing the last message to people who would be true to God, a message of the everlasting gospel, a message calling the world back to the worship of the Creator, to a rest of trust and peace with Him, a warning to the people of today that this is the hour of God's judgment. The prayers of God's faithful people are heard, Earnest and unselfish men and women called by God bear courageously the testimony of Jesus and show to the world a loving Savior, standing for them in the heavenly sanctuary, pleading on behalf of those who choose to serve Him. This is the hour men must decide, as men did so long ago, whether they will serve themselves and have their religion their way, or serve God and follow His way, do His will, and keep His commandments. It was a message which the fallen one, the enemy of Christ, would oppose with every means available. But it was a message to be given with great power, that same power with which the Church of Purity had long ago been endowed, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of Christian men and women, the young and the old who, in obedience to God's every commandment, would in faith and righteousness bear the testimony of Jesus. The gospel of the three messengers ended with an awful warning, a warning against the mark of the beast, a mark that is the sign of the secret one, 
the enemy of God. It is a warning that in this time of the end, he will have great power to deceive, to enchant and possess men and women, to call down fire from the sky, to finally imitate Jesus himself in an attempt to possess the earth and its people entirely. The warning is to everyone, a warning against false worship, against idolatry, against a wicked woman whose profession is typical of those false religions of the present and the past. The religions which began back in ancient Babylon with the worship of the secret one. It is a warning against a last day edition of these ancient services which would employ the same signs and symbols, the same dependence upon the works of man for a relationship with God. The woman symbol, shown by John as riding the dragon power, is alive today, practicing today, prospering today. The crafts of medicine man and astrologer, of frenzied dance and ancient chant, the music of heathen drums are the sounds of worship today. All these sensual substitutes are designed to hold on enchanted ground the people who in their hearts would serve God. To our whole earth comes the last warning, come out of her, my people, as you came out of Egypt. Come out of the thraldom of a worship that lets any man or object come between you and the Savior. One single principle common to pagan cults and the combining Christian churches is to be established. The point upon which all find agreement is the work of a man, a substitute for a requirement of God. In the symbols and images of the ancient sun worship, in the ways of ancient Babylon and pagan Rome, a common ground will be found. Behind the facade, the apparent unity of political and religious systems is the enemy of God, the secret one, the ancient master of disguise and deception. The final test over all the world will be a choice between the rest that God provides and the substitute for that rest which Satan urges men to honor and by so doing yield control of themselves and the world to him. As every case is decided and the last message of mercy is accepted or rejected by every man and woman, a final, nearly overwhelming deception is planned to mislead the entire world, even if possible, those who have chosen to serve God. As the guise of a serpent masked the deceiver of Eden, so now the evil one undertakes the master counterfeit of all time, the impersonation of Christ himself. Satan appears on the earth as Jesus, heals the sick, raises the dead, unites his followers of various communions, creeds, and cults. The world at large, enchanted by the impersonation, then seeks to silence forever those who will not accept the clever counterfeit of worship as he directs. Now Jesus, the minister in the heavenly sanctuary, casts aside the censer of incense, lays aside the robe of his intercession for men, and dons the robe of King of Kings, and prepares to return to the earth to deliver his people. As the followers of the false Christ advance to destroy the people of God, and the influence of God's spirit and the restraints of holy messengers are released, the earth is inundated in disaster, followed by calamity as the seven last plagues are poured out upon those who have received the mark of the beast. The sun men have worshipped indeed has its day, a day of destruction, a day of awful anguish, a day without rest for the wicked, a day for those who refuse the day of God. For God's people, the day of deliverance is a day of rest, a day of trust in Him, a day that Jesus gives them. In every heart is an eager hope of seeing and being with Jesus. As the dark clouds of the sky are rolled back, in the east a small black cloud appearing about the size of a man's hand is seen moving rapidly across a fast brightening sky. It grows larger, spreading across the heavens. Messengers in thousands and ten thousands are seen accompanying the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus, the crucified and resurrected one, has come to claim his people. The trump of God has sounded like a mighty roll of thunder. Its shockwaves reach into the graves, and around the world the faithful of every age are resurrected. My God is come. And all the angels with him And he's promised to take me up to 
people then living are caught up with the resurrected ones and are taken from the earth to meet Jesus. The message of the faithful messenger has done its work. A people have been prepared. The pain and tears of earth are all behind them now. They are given new bodies without the touch of aging, disease, or death. New hearts without the pull or tug of old selfishness. New lives, new hopes, a new future in which to enjoy the peace of a new Eden, a new home for mankind. Those faithful to God from every age are now brought together for a thousand-year reign with Him in the New Jerusalem. The holy city becomes a universal center of celebration of the victory of God's people over the wicked one. Here the records of earth are opened and the judgments of God with respect to every individual disclosed. While the sins of God's people have been eradicated and forgotten, the records of the unrepentant are there that all might see and confirm God's justice in dealing with every man. The wicked one during this time is isolated upon the earth. Alone with the messengers he has deceived, he must contemplate the ruin of a world and endure the passing of centuries, conscious of the loss he has sustained in his rebellion. As the thousand years draws to a close, Satan again is allowed to exercise his power for a short time. The wicked are resurrected. The earth is repopulated with the humanity of six millenniums. The giants of Adam's and Noah's day, the builders of Babel's tower, powerful pharaohs and kings of Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome, the unsaved of every age, those who chose to serve themselves face another grim morning. They come from the grave as they went into it, aged and diseased, unrepentant and unready to face their God. As the city of God rests upon the earth, the wicked, thinking to take the city, march across the broken surface of the land, ordered in columns under the banner of the master they have long served. Above them in the sky, a panorama of earth's history is displayed. Before every man and woman, before Satan himself, pass the scenes of their lives, the events of the great controversy between the evil one and the creator. They see the fall of man in Eden, the penalty paid by Christ. They recall the invitation of God's faithful messenger to accept the mercy of Jesus. They bow, acknowledging the sovereignty of God, and then, as though hypnotized and mad, they rush relentlessly toward the city of God in a last desperate effort to take it by force, to have it for themselves. As this last act of rebellion demonstrates the control of the evil one over every unrepentant sinner, Fire falls in mercy from heaven, and a lake of fire as broad as the world engulfs and destroys it all. It is the separation of the sinner from God forever and ever. Nothing remains as a reminder. Sin and sinner, together with Lucifer and the disloyal messengers, are forever destroyed. The fires of destruction become the fires of recreation. The world is bathed in fire. The elements are reduced to their simplest state and the Creator again prepares the earth as a new, more glorious Eden where man may find a home. A world for his faithful children. A world more beautiful than ever before. A world of peace and safety. A world where Jesus and the redeemed of earth may dwell in happiness together. A world of love. A love eternal. 